Hello, uh, I'm Albert Altarriba, uh, professor at the University of Vic, uh, Central University of Catalonia in, in Barcelona. And I will talk about uh, this topic, recovery in soccer, uh, post-game recovery strategies in elite male soccer players. So uh, first of all, I want to, to explain to you that this presentation is the result of, of my PhD, and it includes uh, three publications around the, the topic of recovery in soccer. Uh, and I will explain briefly the motivation and the rationale of the, of the thesis. So as you can see, here is the, our first publication. It's a systematic review with meta-analysis. We decided to, to do this, uh, this type of, of study because we wanted to, to have a a global vision about the, the topic. And we wanted to collect some uh, scientific evidence uh, about the, the use of uh, recovery strategies in, in professional soccer. So we decided to do this, this topic. And as you will see, uh, we couldn't find uh, many RCTs uh, in professional football players. So then uh, it moves us to the second study because uh, we couldn't find uh, many evidence. So the question was probably is because they are not using recovery strategies, but not with the second study. Uh, we that it's a descriptive cross-sectional cross study. Uh, we uh, arrived to the conclusion that it was not because they were not using uh, recovery strategies. It was because they were uh, uh, not doing RCTs in professional football. So then uh, we decided to, to, to do uh, a parallel group randomized trial. Uh, it, uh, we didn't use a control group because it was uh, developed in elite football players and uh, to put a control group without doing anything was not ethical. So that's the main reason why we decided to a parallel group randomized trial when both groups did uh, or used some recovery strategies, but I will go deeper in the following slides. So first of all, we will start with a literature review about the, the, the main topic of, of recovery. And we divided uh, this part uh, in, in three. So first of all, we will start with uh, the recovery in a sport or global vision. So. As you can see here, the, the recovery process is, is regarded as an in intra-individual, multi-level and multifaceted process, physiologically, but also uh, psychologically. And here you can see the, the general adaptation syndrome figure that uh, was developed, first of all, for Hans Helier, but that one is adapted from, from West, where you have a, an, uh, you put a, an input or you put a stimulus. Then you go to an alarm stage, and after that, uh, if you are doing this properly, you will go to the super compensation or a new level of performance. And if you are not doing properly, you will go through an exhaust an exhaustion stage or uh, overtraining syndrome. So then, in the second one, what we want to show is that recovery is related to previous loads, and depending on the individual uh, capacities of of each player, uh, they will. Uh, uh, succeed or not, okay? Uh, but also it depends on time between between sessions or games and the activities or the strategies that we are uh, taking uh, in that time frame. It's not only about the capacities of the players, it's also uh, uh, because, uh, or it's also related to the time between sessions or games that we uh, are using uh, on them. Okay, in the third one, uh, we want to show that restoring uh, pre-performance levels as quickly as possible is considered crucial to success in, in every sport. And all the teams, uh, staff, members, and athletes are continuously searching for the most effective strategies to accelerate post-exercise recovery process. Uh, it is known that the sufficient and proper choice of, of recovery strategies by, by coaches and athletes may be crucial also to prevent uh, injuries and health problems, and at the same time to, uh, to achieve or to lead them to better performances uh, and helping them to feel uh, more recovered uh, and, and rest. Uh, moreover, what we know is that the, the performance improvement is, is not achieved through a high quantity of recovery activi activities, but through a high, a high sorry, 
quality, well-matched and individualized approach to recovery according to uh, athlete situation specific needs. So uh, one of the main important things is that we have to adjust a recovery process to the individual uh, demands of each player. So we have to personalize it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are many practitioners that apply it according to their coaching experiences or what they have observed at higher levels and need to follow scientific recommendations. That's one of the, the main reasons what we, uh, why we also try to develop this, uh, this thesis. And at some point, recovery is uh, already considered more important than training uh, in, in some sports. And a lot of resources have been used for, for that purpose in, the, in recent years. Okay. Moreover, it's, it is uh, changing the approach from recovery to train to uh, train to recover. So this is uh, another approach or another uh, theory that uh, it's coming through the, the, last, the last years. Huh? So that instead of uh, do recovery to train, we should train to recover, especially in some sports uh, like basketball, okay? The second part, we'll talk briefly about the recovery strategies classification. This is the one that we uh, adapted from, from Venter and, and Crowder. So we divided the, the recovery strategies in natural, physical, psychological, complementary, and alternative or other. And the third part, this is, uh, uh, we will give some tips about, uh, about soccer. So we know that uh, the competitive game demands have uh, changed a lot during the last, uh, the last years. Uh, and it's important that, uh, uh, we have, uh, that we consider all of them. So physiological, uh, physiologically, depending on the player and on the position, but the, the average distance that a player can recover during a game is between 10 and 12 kilometers hour, in between 80-90% of the rate max, when 70-80% uh, of uh, his VO2 max. Okay, and physically, there are uh, what we observe in the last years is that the, the high intensity actions have increased, especially uh, accelerations, decelerations, and sprinting actions. So here you have a, a little uh, brief resume of, of what uh, soccer demands. But it's also important to highlight that, that factors such playing position, playing a style, venue, result of the game, and other contextual factors can affect uh, such physical demands and consequently uh, the recovery process. Okay. So what happens is that uh, we also have in professional soccer uh, a lot of games, they have to play a lot of games. And it is known that playing two games per week and having less than or equal to four days to recover, that leads to a low performance state and increases the risk of sustaining a, an injury, okay? So there is a lot of information about what soccer demands. And we already know that we need at least 72 hours to normalize performance parameters from a single game. But if we increase the number of games per week at two, so we will need more time to get recovered. So it's important to take into account because now in professional soccer, as you can see in the figure, we have a lot of games and we usually play more than one game per week. So we should consider that. Okay, so that's one of the main reasons why we should consider to uh, pay more attention to recovery. And we uh, change the, the point of view, as I said before, from uh, recovery to train, to train to get recovered and compete at the, the same level as uh, we were doing before. Okay, so these are uh, some of the objectives declared about the players, uh, what they think about recovery. Okay, so they thought that uh, they, uh, the, the recovery strategies alleviate muscle damage and fatigue, minimize injury risk, or optimize performance. They also uh, uh, reported uh, that uh, some of the strategies give, uh, give them a better subjective perception. And uh, there are some scientific evidence-based strategies, as we can see here, uh, the, the ones with the plus, they have uh, a lot of evidence. The, the ones with the minus, they don't have evidence. And the, the ones with plus and minus have uh, somehow uh, evidence or are controversial. Some articles said that, yes, that uh, there are 
use uh, useful or in some articles said that they are not useful. So we can see here that nutrition, hydration, whole body cryotherapy uh, has a positive effect and uh, science says that. Cold water immersion, compression garments, sleep, massage, foam roller, uh, there are different articles that said that yes, some articles said no, and then electrostimulation, stretching, active recovery, or psychological, uh, they, don't know, they don't have evidence and more uh, research is needed. So that's the, the, the last point. So we have uh, to uh, put more efforts uh, in high quality research, okay? So what we decided here, or what we found is that there is a gap uh, in elite professional soccer players because of most of this information comes from uh, amateur or non-professional players. And that's one of the main reasons why we decided to develop this thesis as I explained it to you before. So the aims and methods of this thesis, um, the main aims was first of all, with the, the systematic review and meta-analysis was to review the available evidence on the value of post-game recovery strategies in male professional soccer players, not female, we didn't include female. The second aim was to determine the effect of using recovery strategies on post-game performance. We achieved this, uh, this aim with the first article, the systematic review on meta-analysis and the last one, the, the parallel cross, uh, the parallel uh, randomized uh, trial. To describe and report the use of recovery strategies by La Liga teams, uh, with the second article, we could achieve or we could know better what uh, professional teams in, uh, in La Liga were doing. And with the last article, uh, we also uh, try to compare the effectiveness of two comprehensive recovery protocols on physiological, neuromuscular, and perceptual outcomes after a soccer game in elite soccer players. The methods that we used, uh, we explained it before, a systematic review with meta-analysis, comparing control versus intervention, an observational cross-sectional descriptive study with all 23 La Liga teams between the seasons 2018-19 and 2019-20, and an interventional balanced parallel group randomized trial. So in the last one, what we did was to uh, recruit uh, all the under-21 Mexican national team. Uh, we uh, exposing them to a, a competitive game between, between them. And from team A, we took a number of players. From uh, team B, we took a number of players. We excluded goalkeepers. But at the end, we only uh, considered or we only could analyze 18 players because two of them, one of each team, uh, suffered from, from an injury. And then we proposed two different recovery interventions. One of them, we gave... Uh, carbohydrate and protein shake, foam roller, uh, and a cold water immersion, plus a cherry juice. And with the other group, we gave uh, them a, a carbohydrate and protein shake. Uh, we performed a stretching protocol, and we did intermittent uh, cold water immersion. In both groups, we used different recovery strategies, because as I explained to you before, it was not ethical to use a control group without doing anything in elite, because we know that doing uh, some recovery strategies helps them to feel more recovered and healthier. So we decided to put uh, two different intervention groups. So this was the timeline that we used and we, uh, we used that time points uh, uh, immediately after the game. And then we uh, measured them at day, at match day plus one, it was more or less 24, uh, 20 sorry, hours after the game, and at my, uh, match day plus two and match day plus three, 44 and 68 hours after the game, plus the baseline values and data collection that we took from all of, all of them. As you can see uh, here, uh, you, uh, we took different measures, uh, total quality recovery perceived exertion, muscle soreness, we obtained that with a, with a questionnaire, uh, CK3, that is a muscle uh, damage marker, and maximal voluntary contraction and counter movement jump. So during the game, they uh, were um, uh, analyzed or uh, the, the, the external load demands were recorded using a GPS. Uh, and at the end, we uh, could uh, arrive or we could put all of them in the same, in the same group because the, the, the External load demands for all the players was more or less more or less the same, so it was not a bias. 
Okay, the results, we will start with the first one, with the systematic review with, with meta-analysis. Uh, at the end, we could only uh, analyze five RCTs, in total 69 participants, and we made, uh, we included from these five, only four were included for primary outcomes, okay? So we analyzed uh, six anal analyses were performed, two for counter movement jump, two for the sprint uh, ability, and two for maximal voluntary contraction, and a comparative analysis for primary outcomes between groups, control group and intervention group, showed that for the, uh, the counter movement jumps, no difference at 24 hours, but greater CMG values at 48 hours in favor of the intervention group. Uh, we can see that uh, at 24 hours, there is a tendency to, uh, to have better results in the intervention group, but not significantly. And the same with the 20 meter sprint or MBC, that they didn't show uh, differences either at 24 or 48, uh, significant differences, okay? The tendency is that the intervention group had better results, but not significant. So uh, we were comparing uh, control versus baseline within group comparative analysis, and neither intervention nor the control group showed changes in CMJ, uh, J, or 20 meter sprint performance at 24 or uh, not 48 hours compared to baseline. But it was a trend of decreased performance in both groups, except of encounter movement jam intervention group at 48 hours. Maximal voluntary contraction was decreased at 24 hours and 48 hours for the control group, and a trend of decreased performance in the intervention group was present. So from these results, we can conclude that it is important to keep using recovery strategies, even the results were not significant, but and that players from the intervention group always recovered better than the control group ones that didn't do anything. So it gives us a key that we should keep uh, using recovery strategies. With the second one, uh, all 23 teams who played in La Liga during seasons 2018-19 and 19-20 uh, uh, received this, this survey, so they answered to this survey, uh, and uh, they had to check box, uh, different boxes or respond to liquor scales and open-ended uh, free text response, uh, responses. So, What we have from them is that all teams use recovery strategies at some point uh, during the season. There was only one team that didn't uh, propose any strategy after practices, neither uh, pre-season nor in-season. And that natural recovery strategies were the most popular among, among teams, except the pool-based cooldowns, with only 48% of the teams uh, that performed that. Physical recovery strategies such as cold, ice, bath, shower, immersion, massage, and foam rolling were also used by most of the teams. More than 90% of the teams reported that they were using these strategies. And in contrast, psychological and alternative recovery strategies were less popular among teams. After competition and after in-season training, here you can see what they were doing. This is an infography uh, developed by Anne Le Maire. So it was... Uh, a uh, great honor to, to have this uh, article uh, uh, um, published in the Jan Le Maire, uh, website, and we, uh, we show it here because it uh, gives you a clear vision of what they were using. So I, um, uh, I suggest you to, to go to the, the article or to the infography to know better what was happening. Okay. Uh, this is what uh, we found, the main, the main results, that after competition, the majority of the teams reco uh, used recovery strategies for all the players. And in-season practices were more generalized, being uh, used for, for all the players of the squad in 11 teams or half of the players of the squad in the other 11 teams. So if you want to go deeper to the, uh, to the results, I suggest you to, to download the article because you will have a, a clear vision. So in, in this article, we found that the majority of the teams periodize recovery depending on the microcycle. Only, did, only two did not periodize it. 
they also uh, individualize the 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 recovery except two teams that they didn't do it. Twenty teams used uh, recovery strategies immediately after training or competition in less than two hours or within two and twelve hours. And uh, all teams combine strategies. For instance, all teams use more than one recovery strategy. For this reason, in the following study, we propose to compare two different combination of methods protocol. This is the last one. So the main <coughs> result is that no differences between protocols uh, were found. Okay, the, the ones that are different from baseline at the, the, the post-game time point are totally normal, and we cannot link this with the use of any recovery strategy because they weren't used yet. So from here, we found that it existed a, a time effect because there is a, a decrease in performance immediately after uh, post-game. So this is uh, totally totally normal. And of course, uh, according to the what we have said previously that uh, the ones that are different from the baseline at the post game uh, are totally normal because they didn't use uh, uh, recovery strategies immediately after the post game. So we cannot link that with uh, that thing. Okay. So we can see all of them here. The, the ones in, in red are different from, from baseline, the ones uh, in blue are different from, from post game. And another thing. Uh, that we did, uh, we carried out an extra analysis using GPS data and muscle damage values, and we noted that the changes in CK3, that is a muscle damage marker after the game, were correlated to the number of accelerations, decelerations, uh, high in highest, uh, high speed running distance and a sprinting distance. However, total distance was not correlated to muscle damage changes. So it's a good thing to know. Uh, when we have to prepare uh, or when we have to decide uh, to use recovery strategies or not. We know that uh, for the total distance, for example, is not necessary, but from all the rest, it has a correlation because the CK3, that is a muscle damage marker, uh, correlates with all of them. So at the end, with the, we arrived to that conclusion. Cold water immersion, compression garments, and a sleep hygiene strategy offers greater positive effects on uh, neuromuscular outcomes but not impact on the 20 meter sprint or maximal voluntary contraction uh, compared to a control group. All the teams from La Liga use recovery strategy. Elite uh, professional soccer teams use natural strategies more than physical, psychological, or complementary. And all uh, Spanish La Liga teams use foot and fluid replacement with the highest levels of adherence after games and practices. From the last study, the two protocols were equally effective for improving uh, physiological, neuromuscular, and perceptual outcomes. Physiological outcomes were completely normalized at match day plus three, and neuromuscular and perceptual at match day plus two. We didn't show you the perceptual outcomes, but you can find it uh, in the articles that we uh, did show you at the beginning of the, the presentation. There were large and very large correlations between muscle damage markers and accelerations, acceleration, the sprint distance, and high speed running distance. So, how it should be implemented? We suggest how uh, to design multi method recovery protocols to embrace all outcomes. Uh, and also, we need the cooperation of multidisciplinary teams, okay, uh, when, when designing these this type of interventions. We have to analyze resources and time needed. An ecological analysis should be performed when designing and prescribing recovery protocols. Individualizing and balancing expectations, belief, and preferences with scientific evidence. We should individualize, periodize, and use combination of recovery methods at the right moment and frequency according to the desired objectives, players' preferences, and perceived effectiveness of recovery, but also following scientific recommendations, okay? We should analyze recovery and load responses even individually and take into account uh, baseline levels. Inter-individual responses, responders and not responders, uh, it's, it's an important thing to take in, into account. And also, we should take into account the recovery kinematics individually and according to the individual recovery strategies that the players have chosen. We should also monitor external load parameters in training and games to uh, 
uh, manage and individualize recovery strategies better. We should consider pros and cons of physiological performance and per perceptual tests. Uh, perceptual tests are less time consuming and do not physical strain compared to physiological ones, but it's a perception, okay? So we, con uh, we suggest you to use all of them, to use perceptual, but also physical tests and biochemical markers if you, if you can. And that's all. I try to resume everything uh, very fast and uh, I'm very happy to, to put, give you another point of view. Uh, I show you my contact and, and that's it. Many, many thanks for, for your attention. And if you, you need anything, you have my email here or my, my Twitter account. Thank you very much.